I am Bill Cortright with Living Right with Bill Cortright. And this is the Stress Mastery Podcast, where we take you from the science to the spirituality of stress mastery. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Stress Mastery Podcast. I am Bill Courtright and I am here with a special guest today. We are coming live from the Breaking Free event and I am so excited to have this guest. He's an international star, musical star. His name is Paul Baudry and Paul was nice enough to play and open our uh, Breaking Free Weekend and he's going to close our Breaking Free Weekend. So hey, good to have you here, Paul. Hey Bill, I'm so excited to be here. Hello everyone. Oh How's my everybody God. Doing? I'm so excited for this. Now, Paul and I, we met um, we have the same speaking agent. Yes. So we kind of met with, with Darlene Aiken. And Darlene Aiken. That's yeah, right. still, I love Darlene so much. And so we met well, a couple of years ago. It was now, almost right? two years ago. Yeah, almost, almost two, two It was two February 1st, 2016. Wow. Man, age. I'm aging right <laughs> as we talk on the mic. I've started to age and everything else. So, Paul, let's, let's jump into this thing. Tell us a little bit about you tell us a little bit about you and i really want to get in to uh you have a current you got a new album and, a new, and we, we talked about it i don't know if we call them albums or or what we do we but we call it a recording we call it a recording, we call it a recording. so you got a new recording out and everything yes. so tell us a little bit about yourself okay um a little bit about me so you know when i was growing up i somehow had an affinity for music you know my mother uh and father they liked the idea of you know making us do classical piano, me and my brother, and so. Well, you know, Dan Waldschmidt was like that. Yes, I don't know. Yeah, so I Dan, heard. so I gotta introduce you to Dan. He'll yeah. love you. Oh, yes. I've been follow, I've read yeah. Dan's book. It's amazing, yeah. and thank you for recommending that on the podcast. Yes, I mean, I've, I've listened to almost every podcast you've done. Wow, so thank you. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry that. about Super Millennial. <laughs> so I, I, I'm really sorry, but I have to. I have to bring him with me. Oh, he's wonderful. He's, man. <laughs> <laughs> he's the comic relief man. He's the one that keeps everything going. He, he really is the one that keeps. <laughs> you, you seem to be behind the scenes, right, Paul? Uh, yes, I do. It's, it's super millennial does all the work. Does all the work. He it's really does everything. Trip. I sit down and talk. This is really hard. <laughs> it's really hard. So tell well, us, tell us about your league. childhood and how you got in. Because you're a bass player, I'm a bass but player. you're not uh, like a bass player like I would see in the rock and roll stage. You're a real bass player. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, a little bit about the journey. So uh, I found that I actually enjoyed music, but. Um, uh, for some reason, I just wasn't connecting with my early teachers, but I found out later on, but they, my, my early teachers saw something, and, you know, my parents had just weren't really into the idea of me being a musician. Right, <laughs> like, okay. You know, even in the 70s, they were like, okay. ah, I don't think so. Um, anyway, I played a number of different instruments. I played trumpet for a while. I played drums, actually, all through junior high school and high school. And then it wasn't until I just got really interested in learning how to compose, learning how mm -hmm. to arrange, and just doing a lot of self-study. And so while I was going through high school, I used to write my own music. I, I learned how to play all the different instruments and record all of my, re record myself playing all the different instruments mm -hmm. on these little things that they used to have. It was like a, it was a, a Tascam four track recorder and you can get up to 10 different tracks on it by okay. bouncing everything around. So. I got really into composition and arranging just because I just love to do it. Yeah, and there wasn't really anybody around showing me anything. I just So you just figured it out on your I, own, I, right? Yeah, yeah. And then so I was really hungry but uh, for for the knowledge, but uh, the idea, you know, of going to music professionally was just like uh, I you know, it wasn't really going to be a reality. So, um, I got a full ride scholarship to go to California Polytechnic State University as a computer science major. Wow, so I, I studied, did not know that, yeah, Paul. Keep I, on going. This is interesting. <laughs> I'm learning more about you as we go here. Right, right. So I did internships at IBM and at Apple Computer, and um, all for all through the college years. And what happened when I first got to the dorms? I was a drummer, right, primarily. Okay. And uh, but I had learned how to play the bass and piano and guitar and all these other things when I used to record all of my own music, right? Well. Uh, I couldn't practice drums in the dorms. <laughs> right, that, that could <laughs> be a problem. <laughs> that could so be a problem. I had, I had to yeah. do something that yeah. wasn't going to make a yeah. lot of noise. <laughs> so I got an electric bass and practiced it without the amp, and I can practice all night long. It doesn't bother anybody. Well, I got, I got pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. And then I started performing on it, and eventually I found that I loved that more than, uh, than playing drums because it was closer to composing. 
you know, and so uh, eventually I, I just gravitated towards that. And um, the more I started listening to jazz, the more I started hearing like on those Miles Davis records, yes. and Dave Brubeck records, yes. and those things that they had the upright acoustic bass. Mm -hmm. And I, when I first thought of doing that, it just seemed like it was such a huge animal of an instrument. I'm like, oh my goodness. I mean, that's getting serious. And so. you gotta, <laughs> and you gotta travel with, and that's like travel traveling with, with, with is it, it's like your girlfriend, right? You're <laughs> oh, traveling yes. with that thing all oh, over, yeah. everywhere, all over the world, oh, right? Yeah, definitely, yes? definitely. So um, it was a beast and it was a big decision and to be quite honest, so I, I, I finally made this decision, you know, and th at this point I'm almost finished with my computer degree mm -hmm. and I've already done a couple internships with uh, IBM. And um, just before I started working at my last summer internship at Apple, I, uh, I said, you know what, I'm just gonna pray. Okay. And, and, and I'm gonna practice like two hours a day. Mm -hmm. And if I still sound like a dying cow by the end of the year, <laughs> I'm going to quit. You're going to quit, right? So you gave yourself you gave yourself a timeline, right? I gave myself a yeah. timeline. But, you know, at the end of that first year, I was actually sounded pretty good. Mm -hmm. So um, You are amazing, by the way. Oh, thank that you. That was amazing. You had the whole crowd just mesmerized. Oh, wow. And you happened to play my wife's most favorite song I in the world. And she just, she, she, thought, she thought I set it up. Oh wow! No, well, she thought I set it up, that. and and you you played that song, and she she goes, how did he know? I go, well, I don't know. Maybe that was divine intervention for right, you. Right, right. You know. Yeah. So when you're playing, um, so you were practicing a lot. Then do you find that when you're practicing, that's kind of like your meditation too? Do you find oh that's when you go in? So you know. people always think that meditation is this thing where you got to be uncomfortable and sit and force. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Right. Meditation can be playing music meditation can be for me people think it's weird but my workouts are meditative oh, yeah. when I work out because meditation is when you are in that moment yes. there's nothing else in the world going on oh my god so is yeah. that what you experience as that's definitely what I experienced um, just to finish a little bit of my story what mm -hmm. happened was uh, uh, so after I decided that I was actually doing okay I wasn't gonna quit I mm -hmm. found out about the Aspen music school which is one of the top classical music schools in the world to go to, and they had an, uh, some audition requirements, and I said, oh, wouldn't it be nice if I, uh, if I can just go for it? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care if I fail. And this is one of the things about going for something. Yes. You have to accept failure first. You, you know what, you because you, you can't fight it, because what you fight becomes stronger. So if you're fighting, fighting not to fail, right. You're actually going to strengthen you, it. Exactly. Because so you you look at how your your life kind of shaped, and that's kind of what we teach in stress mastery. You're looking at it that you had a passion, right? But it's not a passion that fits into the into the norm, exactly. right? And because you hear about that. the starving artist, which I I can't stand that because I think it's a horrible program. Right. But then you actually you must have been pretty good at computers too, right? Oh yeah. I mean, so I you could have made a living if oh, you wanted to. I you could have went traditional. Jobs right out of the gate, I could have been making good it, money. Yeah. Straight out of college, you know, I don't know how much money I'd have in Apple stock right now if I bought <laughs> some 20 years ago. <laughs> and, but then you follow, you decide, you make that decision. You know, how, did, how does that weigh on you? And how did your family react when you decided to make that decision that you're going to be a professional musician? Well, what happened was, you know, uh, I it's one of those things that I'm, I'm lucky enough to say that I know for a fact that at the end of the day, they love me. Yes. That's so the unconditionally, day. they love you. Uh, you're the very, you're very fortunate. <laughs> just so you yeah. know. So, but the, but the thing is, is that they weren't going to put a red cent in the music education. So. Right. Okay. Uh, so what I did is I made all the money on my own. Mm -hmm. I bought a station wagon. Mm -hmm. I bought a bass. I, I I applied for the Aspen School of Music. I actually got in. I got a full scholarship to be the, the jazz bass player, and I was accepted into the classical orchestras. But the only classical music that I knew was the audition requirements and that was it because that's all I did for a year. I just got practiced it. the audition requirements. Wow, so that's so. another thing. I think we need to pause for a second on that too because another thing when you're following, I, I'm, I'm the same way. I'm very patient when I'm building something. Right. You know, I always kind of know where I'm going to be five years from now. In fact, I know exactly where I'm going to be five years from now. So I'm very patient when I'm building something. So mm -hmm. you were very patient. You weren't worried about learning a bunch of classical no. music. You had to do one thing at I, a time. You had to get in. That I had to get yeah. in. And the thing is, I didn't even care if I didn't get in. I was just like, you know, I, I, I right? got to do this. This is going to be what that's I'm going to do. And I just prayed every night. And I said, look, if I'm supposed to do this, I'm going to do this. If not, not. It's cool. You yes. Know? And so it was sort of like a, a, a dedication uh, um, 
in action mm -hmm. and yet release at the same time because I didn't really care about the results. You know, that's the way you're supposed to live your life, right? <laughs> you know that? Yeah. Because when you, and, and we're actually in today's um, session, we're going to go over that because the wants are what holds us back because it's what holds the ego together. Mm -hmm. So these wants, say, so if you're going in there and you want so badly to be approved and you want to belong and you want security because this mm -hmm. and you want control and when you let all that go and you let life flow, man, life is magical. It is magical. And that's how you got into right. everything you're doing. Because it's, it's the dedication to the yes. art at the end of the day that matters. I'm like, who, who cares about approval? I mean, yeah. honest, really. Uh, uh, it's just a bunch of people, really. And, and it means nothing. And you know what? You, you said something very important and I want the, the um, audience to understand this it's the dedication to the art and I remember Randy Gage I was speaking with Randy Gage on stage and he said something um, and Randy Gage is this big entrepreneur right he mm -hmm. goes being an entrepreneur is being an artist mm -hmm. see art is mastering whatever you're doing if mm -hmm. you're mopping the floor you can do it as an artist where mm -hmm. you're present and mm -hmm. you ever see somebody where they're doing a job and they just love their job and you, you would think wow that's just a simple job but they love their job that's an artist that's, right. that's an artist you know that's so right. everybody thinks an artist like I have a daughter that's a painter and a mm -hmm. photographer mm -hmm. and and actually David uh, super millennials very he's into it, pictures he's he's really creative in there that's why mm -hmm. when they try to fit him into business school he didn't fit very mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so that's an artist so Paul tell us now you have a solo album out right now right yes I do solo album out and the funny thing with this one is uh, I started working on this one in 2008 it was supposed to be my first record hey. but some other things came up I had a jazz quartet that was doing really well we were accepted into a program by the US State Department to okay. travel and we played in 12 different countries between 2010 and 2012 and that band ended up making two different records and a, a record company approached me to do a third record with that band and I said you know what I gotta go back to this project I started back in 2008 because that was kind of also your your passion we think about when you were in school you were the one putting all the different things together because exactly. you like to compose you like exactly. to construct things so. exactly so you turned down the contract you turned down the record deal I, I turned it down one? I said I gotta do my project yeah I gotta get mm -hmm. this done this is the one thing I gotta mm -hmm. get done and it, it, it just finally was was, I picked it up, as I told you, from the disc manufacturer yeah. on Friday. <laughs> the, oh, the so you of. really just came out? No, it just came out. I, I mean, can't this wait. Is like I know you gave old. me a copy. I can't wait to sit down and listen to it and everything. Like, I, I, I opened it for the first time when I was on the airplane. Oh, on the way over here. That was the first that, time I saw it. How did that feel? It was amazing. Yeah, it's like it, I have a baby. It, <laughs> yes, yes. I'm glad you said that because like when you write a book, and you do this and the first time the book comes in and the publisher sends you your book and you open up that case and there it is yeah, it's, it's like, like a wow. baby it's a baby you, people don't realize how much goes into something like that oh you know a, i mean you know i mean we had four different string recording sessions the first three recording sessions of strings we had to throw them out because it didn't really quite work this has been through so many different chances why it took 10 years and, and yes you know? and what's the name of it it's it's called new tomorrows I love it. And it's uh, featuring one of my best friends, Adam Rafferty, who's an amazing guitar player who's now living in Austria. And uh, we've been really good friends for years. And um, actually, he became a good friend of mine because remember when The Secret first came out? Yes. Yes. So he was the only person in my inner circle that I knew that would be interested in really investigating The Secret. And we were going to say, OK, there's some things in there that are good, and there's some things in there that mm -hmm. are missing. Right. Let's get together. Uh, so we, uh, every Wednesday morning from 10 a.m. to 12 noon, we would get together at this Starbucks in Forest mm -hmm. Hills in, in, mm -hmm. uh, in Queens, New York. Mm -hmm. um, and we would talk. We would have a mastermind. Like a two-person mastermind. But, and and, and really, years. that's all you need for a mastermind, by the way, is two people. Yeah. And that's very cool. And we went through so many different gurus like Brian Tracy, yep. Anthony Robbins, mm -hmm. and, all this, and we were trying to find all the missing pieces mm -hmm that weren't in the secret. And the one thing I love about the secret the most is that the number one most important thing, you have to know what you want. Uh, if you don't, and, and here's the thing, you gotta know what you want and you gotta know how to release it. And it's just, it doesn't, it confuses people. We're actually talking about that today, Good. by the way, today's session. Yeah. And that, so the secret, first of all, what Rhonda Byrne did was she introduced the law of attraction. Nobody had heard about it before. Right. You know, I, I had heard about it because I started studying it when I was in my early 20s because mm -hmm. I got very fortunate. I mm -hmm. fell into the teaching 
teachings of Neville Goddard and Joseph Murphy and all these things. And when you start falling into these teachings, you start to realize, and when you start practicing them and they start happening in your life, it changed my life. And I was young. It's mm-hmm. 35 years ago. You know, I was mm-hmm. very young when I found it. Mm-hmm. So when The Secret came out, it didn't shock me. Mm-hmm. And people, a lot of people like to put the book down, but all I can say is I thought it created a great shift because people started realizing, you're right, there's pieces missing in it. Right, right. But I don't think Rhonda could put everything into that book because I think what it, the book desi- was designed to do was to get you to be curious. Oh, it's and it was so the beginning what, of a And so when you think about it, it's exactly what it did for you, Paul. It got you curious and looking at things. Yeah. And so that takes me right into my next um, question is, so you do a lot of personal and spiritual development. Yeah, correct? I've been doing it ever since I got my first Anthony mm-hmm. Robbins cassettes. Yeah, I love, yeah, Anth- the very I love first Anthony. One, the one from the 80s, yeah. remember the personal yes. power yes. series number oh, one. Oh, of course. I got number to meet one. him when I was I was recording with Guthy Ranker and he helped me do a recording once and wow. I, be, I, I I just absorbed everything he had after right. meeting him because he's really like that, you right. know, and he's gotten a little wild in, in later years, And but exactly. I'm going to tell you something. But he, man, that first is, personal development uh, series, it's it still one of the best. Industry. Still one of the best series I've ever heard I, I, because nobody had there. There were like um, Sig Ziglar was out there, and there was motivational speakers out there, but nobody had put a system together. I think Anthony was the first one to really put a system together like that. Oh yeah, and it went crazy. People were going crazy for and it, and it's still know? great. It's it has you know he hasn't written many books because he doesn't need to. He's taught the system, yeah, he's and so he system. taught. He wrote the two books right, and then he just recently wrote one on money, which I think is one of the best books I've, on money. I always, yeah. I always tell especially millennials should read that book because you learn about investing and everything else mm-hmm. from a different standpoint but he hasn't written many other books because he doesn't need to no. yeah he gave you a perfect system oh yeah right? totally. and Absolutely. so what is your what does your routine look like so when you wake up during the day what does your routine look like because I know you're on the road you're like me we're on the road yeah we're and on the road people have to understand being on the road is another art it's another, <laughs> another art. I shared a lot of uh, you know, Facebook it, lives it's and, another uh, art and my son's now 14 years old yeah. that's an art in and of itself yeah I got that too <laughs> <laughs> that's no joke. Yeah, that's no right. joke. So what's right. it like? How, what's your so, routine like? Uh, as it turns out, that my schedule ends up being a little bit hectic. You know, sometimes I'm doing uh, sessions in the morning. Sometimes I'll be teaching at schools, doing workshops like in Brooklyn or in Queens or in Manhattan to teach kids about jazz. Anything from you know age seven all the way to high school. Uh, but I'm also a teacher over at the Teachers College, which is a part of Columbia University. Okay. So, you know, over there, most of my students are PhD students. Okay. You know? And when I was working with the U.S. State Department, I had to get really used to teaching anything from age eight all the way to master's degree Got students it. and doing workshops. So I had to get very versatile and really understand at what level people mm-hmm. actually, what, what information they need. So, I mean, I'm not going to talk to a group of master's degree students the way I would talk to seven-year-olds exactly. and vice versa. So you yep. really have to have these different modes. So I've had to study some teaching, just the art of teaching itself, mm-hmm. you know. And then uh, sometimes I'm doing recording sessions and rehearsals and, and performing at night. So, And then, I'm of course, when I'm traveling. So what I have to do, knowing that all these pieces are sort of moving mm-hmm. around, you know, I, you know, was really sort of trying to find a system in place and uh, by divine guidance, uh, I've been listening to you, you know. And I'm sorry. I, I've been, <laughs> you know, and, and, and what sorry. happened was a couple of years ago, after listening to all these different personal development mm-hmm. people, your five life categories was the first time in my mm-hmm. life all that stuff made sense. And I'm not making this up. You know, Thank I you. mean, this is actually, that's like why I'm here, yeah. you know. You are, you're you're not only at the event, you're in the climber community. Yes, you're I am. And, and, and by the way, when you come on and we do our live thing in the climber community, everybody wants to hear from you. Just so you know, that's the oh, emails wow, okay. we got. We go, can Paul speak some more? I go, uh, yeah, they want to hear because you got a lot to teach them. Well, the funny thing is, yeah. is uh, it was actually, I'm going to shout out right now, Grace Van. Was yes, the one Grace. Said, you know what, we she's really need the, you to play. She, she's, she's at the event weekend. again. Yes, so she actually, so I do level events and this is a level one event that introduces the seven steps this is her second time at the level one event so she really she really does follow everything she's in in. and we actually been uh, talking back and forth and she got me finally doing eft (laughs) and i'm going to be talking about that today so we're going to start because it's an amazing tool because it's a tool used to to put your you could you could switch a nervous system over very quickly so everybody knows when they get caught in stress if you can just stop for a minute and do something it changes everything it changes you know So I want. I, I, we're going to run over today. So okay. don't tell David. Because <laughs> I want to. I don't want to stop. I want to okay. ask you some more things in that. Because okay. okay. uh, so, 
as we as you as you went in and you you now have your career going and everything else and you got this and what we're gonna do by the way we're gonna do we have a huge mailing list we're gonna mail out uh, so people can get the the album. Oh, I want to right. I want to and here's one of the reasons that I'm going to do this. It's not by the way it's not an affiliate people. I don't want anything. I want to help Paul, but really I want to help you guys. Uh, so Super Millennial uses your music to relax. Wow. And so he works to it and so does his brother Kevin. Yeah. And so he's studying to become a doctor. And so mm -hmm. your music is playing cuz they use it to relax and helps them to concentrate. It helps us. So classical, can you talk about that a little bit? How classical music and, and the type of music kind of creates, connects to the higher energies? You and know it's brain waves and everything else. Thank but you for saying yeah, something a, like that. I made a conscious decision that I did not want to be a part of a musical production that I didn't want my son to listen to. Excellent. So, I mean, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, but I have a lot of friends. They went into yeah. other styles of music yeah. where I can't stand the lyrics. Yeah. You know, and I'm just going to say, folks, can you please support artists and please support yes. the arts? Because, you know, we're trying to connect to a higher power. Yes. And give people what they need psychologically and it doesn't necessarily always make the most money up front you know maybe yeah. later on you can turn it into yeah. something but when i'm trying to connect to the higher power and give it back to people i'm not asking for dollars i'm not trying to create a social media buzz i'm not trying yes. to create some whirlwind of nonsense just to get more facebook hits or something i'm really trying to do and i'm glad that you're telling me that this is the effect that people well i mean and david to. david's a, a rock and roller and he's he's a young super millennial you know but he, he and he loves it. No, no, he lo he'll come right out. He'll tell anybody who wants to listen that he listens to it. He, I think he was telling everybody before yeah, you came in. So, so that's interesting. Why, how does that work with classical music? Does it kind of change your brainwaves? Why, why well, do you? Why you does know, it make you feel so calm and connected? Well, this is jazz. So, I mean, I had some classical training just yeah. enough so I can learn my instrument. Right. But what I'm playing is, is jazz, and so. Right. Uh, it, it, with along with classical music, what happens is, and, and when I'm performing and mm -hmm. when I'm on stage, I you know I have a body and I've mm -hmm. learned all my technique, and at that point it becomes essential to just connect. Yes, that is your only job. I try to connect with the higher power. I'm trying to connect with yes. other people. The audience is a part of what's going to be coming out of my instrument. I try to merge the two energies, and I try to be a channel. And the funny thing is, when it comes to uh, you know musicians trying to have their own sound, what I find is I need to practice. I need to make sure my technique mm -hmm. is together so I can put my fingers in the right place, I can play in tune, that sort of thing. And then after that, I need to get out of the way as much as I can so the music is just channeling you know, from the higher power to the people, but yes. it's using me as the way to do that, and I'll add my own personal taste, but the thing is, my taste comes at the very tail end of that energy transfer, and then that ends up becoming my sound. I'm not uh, obsessed about my sound at the very beginning. That's like the last thing I'm concerned right. about. You know, I really you need to connect, connect first. And so it's the same with speaking, by the way, because oh, wow. I know you're going to be getting into speaking and yes, stuff, and you'll be a natural speaker because Thank it's you. exactly the same way. People always come to me and they want to they want to know how do you do speaking and that. Man, I rehearse, I practice, yep. I do it, and right. I do it as if it was like a, a movie role. That's right. And because I, I have to be able to connect with the audience, but then you know what. I can change it on a dime if I have to. If I feel the mm -hmm. energy is different in a mm -hmm. room, and, I ha and recently this happened, I was speaking to a high school, mm -hmm. and we had a thousand kids in there, and I asked them one question, you know, how many of you think you're not smart? And half of them raised their hands, and in a second, I changed the entire talk. I used the same presentation, but I knew I wanted, and, and it, I could hear a little buzz in my ear is, you, you need to make them believe. Mm -hmm. And so I can change it on a dime, right. but you've got to practice. And, and these these speakers that think that, well, I don't need to. I just go up and I channel it. And I, I go, well, that's really nice, but you're no, really man. telling me you're lazy. Yeah. <laughs> so you're, no. you're telling me, you know, because, or you're scared. That's it for today's show. Our mission is to create a shift in the planet. And you can join us by simply like, share, and subscribe. The links are right below the show. As always, until next time, stay inspired.